So I think I'm okay to introduce our next speaker. Um, so very, very excited for this next session and very excited to learn uh, from Carolyn Shimon. Uh, so she is the patient and public engagement lead at the George and Faye Yee Center for Healthcare Innovation, part of the Manitoba Sports Support Unit. So in this role, Carolyn is responsible for all patient and public engagement and health research programs and services offered at the center, including the patient engagement lunchtime learning series, the patient engagement champions program, the funding award to support patient and public engagement in health research, and the CHI patient engagement collaborative partnership. So with a bachelor's degree combined honors in journalism and political science and a master's degree in gender studies, and we've talked about gender, haven't we, Carolyn? Um, so Carolyn is a big promote, proponent of using a social justice and health equity lens in patient and public engagement. So she writes and speaks about the importance of incorporating a trauma-informed intersectional analysis in order to build truly inclusive and safe spaces within patient and public engagement in health research. So again, a very warm welcome to you, Carolyn. Thank you for imparting all of your wisdom with here with all of us here today. And very excited to be here with everyone listening and learning from you today. So, so huge welcome and thank you. And over to you, Carolyn. Thank you so much, uh, Andrea, um, for the introduction. And thank you so much to everyone who, who's come here today um, to, to join and have this conversation, a really important conversation. I'd first like to apologize. I've been a little bit under the weather lately, so my voice is a little bit raspy, but bear with me. <laughs> um, we'll get through it. Um, so today's topic, just to start out, today's topic, it's not an easy one. Um, and for that reason, I really encourage all of you to practice gentleness and self-care uh, throughout today's session. Uh, so if feelings come up and you need to take a few minutes away from your computer, that's okay. Uh, make yourself a cup of tea or have a tall glass of cold water and sip it slowly or do some breathing and focusing on, on an object, anything to just reconnect yourself to the present and just be gentle with yourself um, as we go through this conversation today. And should you need uh, just a little additional support following today's session, <clears throat> We've posted in the chat box some free national resources that you can access as well, just in case you, after following, you need um, a little support. So to start off, I'd like to start off by acknowledging that myself and the Center for Healthcare Innovation, where I work, are located on the ancestral and current day lands and waters of the Anishinaabeg, Cree, Ojibwe Cree, Dakota, Dakota and Denisulina people, and on the national homeland of the Red River Métis. And in northern Manitoba, we acknowledge the ancestral lands of the Inuit and gratefully acknowledge that our water is sourced from Shoal Lake 40 First Nation. And as an uninvited white settler on these lands, I feel immense gratitude to Indigenous peoples who have been the caretakers and who have lived and worked on this land since time immemorial. And in coming together today, we recognize the, <clears throat> we respect the treaties uh, that were made on these lands. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past. We recognize the ongoing present day colonial violence that is faced by indigenous peoples within healthcare, education, justice, child welfare and government systems. And we dedicate ourselves to moving forward in partnership in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. And really when we start talking about patient and public engagement in health research, Indigenous research methodologies are at the forefront. Um, indigenous scholars and researchers and communities are really who we should be looking to. And it's our belief that when we start talking about trauma-informed engagement, it's really an integral aspect of social justice and health equity. So a bit of an overview of today, we're first gonna just talk about what is trauma and then why is it so important to understand when we talk about engagement in health research? Uh, what does trauma-informed engagement look like? What is the difference between safety and comfort? How do I put trauma-informed engagement into practice? 
And then, uh, and then at the end, we're going to talk a little bit about ways to integrate some self-care into the work you do as well. So as mentioned, I work in the area of patient and public engagement and health research, meaning I get the privilege of working collaboratively with health researchers and clinicians and decision makers and people with lived and living experience of health issues, their families and communities. And I always have this quote, I start out with it all the time. I have it on my office wall, just as a reminder that as human beings, we are complex, all of us. And when we, we simultaneously inhabit many different social locations, and when we come together, we all as individuals bring our own political, cultural, economic, subjective, and experiential knowledge to the table. And what this means is when we do engagement, and some of the best engagement, in my opinion, it can be messy, it can be uncomfortable, it can be complicated. But as Brené Brown uh, says, vulnerability is the birthplace of innovation, creativity, and change. And sometimes the amazing incredible experiential knowledge that people with lived and living experience, their families and communities bring to the table can be intertwined with experiences of trauma. Sometimes health researchers and clinicians also bring experiences of trauma to the table. So what we've learned over time is really that the incorporation of trauma-informed engagement approaches and strategies plays a really integral role in the creation of safe and inclusive spaces for collaboration and co-design, both in health research and health systems projects. So firstly, what is trauma? Uh, it's good to just have a start with kind of a definition to have a better understanding. So trauma is defined as one or more episode, one or more experiences that overwhelm an individual's capacity to cope. A traumatic experience can harm a, a person's sense of safety, their sense of self, and their ability to navigate uh, relationships and regulate emotions. And so long after a traumatic event occurs, a person with trauma can often feel shame or hopelessness or powerlessness and intense fear. And it's really important for all of us who work in health and health research, it's important for us to understand that trauma is a widespread harmful and costly public health issue. And evidence shows that patients with uh, significant trauma histories, it can impact everything from their physical and mental health, their responsiveness to health interventions, and their ability to access appropriate healthcare services. It's also, it, there also needs to be an understanding that healthcare systems themselves that are intended to provide services and supports to individuals may themselves be trauma inducing. Uh, for example, um, things like seclusion or restraints in the behavioral health system or the use of an invasive procedure in the medical health system can be traumatizing to individuals who may have already experienced uh, significant histories of trauma before uh, entering the system. So what do we mean by trauma-informed practice or our trauma-informed approach. It begins with building an awareness amongst everyone on a team, whether you're a health researcher, whether you're a healthcare clinician, whether you're a patient or public or community partner, that trauma is a common experience. And this really points to the idea of the strength and resiliency of people, right? But it also speaks to the fact that when we're developing an engagement strategy, it's really important to integrate trauma-informed approaches no matter what, um, because it's an important aspect. The impact of trauma can be central to one's development. There's a wide range of adaptations people will make in order to cope with and survive trauma. And that's something as a team, we need to learn to sit in non-judgment of those strategies. And then there is a relationship between trauma and substance use, as well as mental and physical health concerns. <clears throat> and so it's also important that uh, we understand the different types of trauma. 
Uh, trauma can be experienced really early in life, uh, including child abuse, so physical, emotional, psychological, and sexual, uh, neglect, witnessing violence, uh, disrupted attachment, but trauma can also occur later in life through experiences such as violence, uh, accidents, natural disasters, war, a sudden unexpected loss in your life, and other life events that are out of one's control. And the intricacies of trauma can't be overstated. So there's a variety of dimensions to trauma, including its magnitude, its complexity, its frequency, its duration, at what age trauma occurs, and whether it happens from an interpersonal or external source. And typically what you hear is that there's five types of trauma. The first one is a single incident. Um, this is when an unexpected or overwhelming event occurs, such as an accident, a natural disaster, a single episode of abuse or assault, a sudden loss, or witnessing violence. So in the healthcare system, it can be an invasive medical procedure or an unexpected diagnosis or a harmful interaction with a doctor. When we start talking about complex or repetitive trauma, that's when abuse is ongoing. So this would be things like domestic violence, uh, living in a war zone, uh, ongoing betrayal, and it often involves feeling kind of trapped both emotionally and physically. And then developmental trauma, this results from exposure to early ongoing or repetitive trauma as an infant or a child or a youth. Things like neglect or abandonment, uh, physical, sexual, or emotional abuse or assaults, witnessing violence or death and or coercion or betrayal. And these types of trauma often occur within a child's caregiving sphere and interfere with healthy attachment and development. And then there's intergenerational trauma, and this really describes the psychological or emotional effects that can be experienced by people who live with trauma survivors. And so what is often seen as coping or adaptation patterns that are developed in response to trauma, which can include substance use, alcohol use, these things can be passed from one generation to the next. And then the final one is historical, structural, or systemic trauma. So historical trauma is the cumulative emotional and psychological wounding over a lifetime and across generations emanating from massive group trauma. And these collective traumas are inflicted by oppressive and dominant systems of power like governments. Uh, examples of um, Historical trauma can include genocide, colonialism, slavery, and war. And it often includes uh, forced displacement from home, discrimination based on race, ethnicity, religion, gender identity, gender expression, sexual orientation, ability, or class. And so in Canada, when we start, start thinking about trauma-informed engagement, it's really important to include an examination of the role of colonization, both past and present, and violence against Indigenous people. It's important to look at the legacy of residential schooling systems and the 60s scoop. All of these things are really important as you start developing your engagement strategy, that everyone has a good understanding of this. And this leads us to what is called structural or systemic or institutionalized trauma, which refers to the way that people are harmed by larger systems that many of us rely on, such as the educational system, the political system, the criminal justice system, employment and healthcare systems. And these systems are set up to serve a small group of people, often at the expense of a larger group. So some groups' needs and voices get set aside while others' needs and voices tend to be centered. And the people that aren't being served by and often harmed by these systems can experience trauma. And systemic trauma really refers to the emotional and psychological harm from inequities enforced through public policies, and institutional practices such as discrimination and economic opportunity, um, employment, education, housing, and healthcare. 
And unlike individual and interpersonal trauma that, that uh, focuses on an individual's response to trauma, things like systemic and structural or institutionalized trauma requires a collective, appro collective response, meaning we all must be committed to responding to these things. And we understand that the effects of trauma can be diverse and they can vary from person to person from minor disruptions in an individual's life to debilitating responses. People may experience anxiety, um, shame, emotional numbness, disconnection, all of these different things, powerlessness. Um, and some of the coping skills that people may develop in response to trauma, um, and perceived ongoing threats, things like difficulty controlling or regulate, regulating emotional reactions, these types of things are common. So why do you think it's important to understand trauma when it comes to patient and public engagement? Maybe we can take a look and see if people have some suggestions. Oh, look at we already have some, some comments in the chat box. Yes, uh, Samira said lots of immigrants and refugees also have experienced lots of trauma. And that's so that's such an important uh, part to, to mention as well. Does anyone have maybe you can type it in your in the chat box if you'd like to think about why do you think it's important for us to know this <clears throat> and to have an understanding? Right, so Sherry mentions trauma can resurface during engagement. That's a good response, Sherry. We need to know so we don't re-traumatize people. Excellent, Julia. Rachel, possibility of inadvertently re-traumatizing. Uh, Maureen says, asking people to share their stories without any support, that's so important. Shannon says, oh, wow, we are just going, look at Satan. <laughs> I can't even keep up to all these wonderful responses. A safe way to write, safe ways of communication. Uh, in research, patient partners and participants are doing us a favor. It's unethical to re-traumatize people for our own professional development. So good. All of these great responses. Wow, you guys are already ahead of the game. <laughs> So let's, oops, just a second, I gotta get back to it. So so you guys all had some really, really good responses to that. So one of the things um, is traumatic events by their very nature set up a power differential where one entity, whether it's an individual, an event, a system or a force of nature has power over another. And so an individual's experience of these events or circumstances are shaped uh, in the context of this powerlessness um, and feelings of humiliation and guilt and shame and betrayal and silencing often shape the experience of this event. So it's really, really important in interpersonal interactions, which play such a predominant role when we think about engagement that these feelings of powerlessness are not being reproduced or reconstituted in any way. So definitely a lot of you mentioned that, that we don't, we wanna set up engagement strategies in a way that we are not re-traumatizing, that we're not reproducing those feelings of powerlessness. And we know that people with lived and living experience come to engagement with a variety of life experiences that shape how they feel. Um, what they think and how they respond when they're interacting with health researchers and healthcare professionals. And some partners have previously perhaps experienced some boundary violations and abuses of power, including interpersonal trauma, but also some have experienced forms of oppression and violence within the healthcare system, such as systemic racism, transphobia, ableism, all of these things. And so it's really important to recognize how it's important when all team members start to really think about this and recognize that it can be really powerful to a partnership um, in building those relationships and in building that trust. So what does trauma-informed engagement look like? 
We'll start off with in Manitoba, <laughs> shout out to Manitoba. Um, quite a while back, we started thinking about how we move towards more inclusive engagement. And through engagement, uh, through lots of engagement and conversations and discussions with community, we started to collaboratively think about the incorporation of both a trauma-informed and intersectional approach when it came to engagement. And this is where the Valuing All Voices framework was born. And this research work was led by the lovely Dr. Catherine Sibley, who I believe is still here, <laughs> yay. Um, so it's wonderful that you have her on Evidence Alliance. Um, and so really this framework was created to complement some of the other frameworks that exist out there, like the Strategy for Patient-Oriented Researchers Patient Engagement Framework. And really it builds on some of those integral aspects of relationship building that we don't always talk about, right? And we don't, um, and so some of those things include self-awareness, uh, education and communication, understanding and acceptance, and trust and relationship building is kind of the overarching piece of it. And so when we talk about, so when we talk about trauma-informed practice, I always like to say it always begins with each of us on an individual level, right? So before we start even thinking about how we're going to develop an engagement strategy that's trauma-informed, we have to do some personal critical reflexive practice. Whether you're a health researcher, whether you're a clinician, whether you're a patient public community partner, this is an important part of the relationship building and engagement process. And so um, having that commitment from the very beginning to ongoing critical reflexive practice, um, to really understand the impact of systemic and institutional trauma, it all, you know, we must also begin to consider how the social locations in which we inhabit have an impact and are connected to larger systems of power and oppression. And this is um, Stephanie Nixon's COIN model. I have the little uh, link there and I can send a link at the end as well. Um, and it really just speaks to uh, the fact that it, systemic inequality uh, is a two sides of the same coin. So in order for people to experience disadvantages that they did not earn, uh, they simply have it because of who they are. There are people at the top of the coin that have to have had a privilege and advantages which they didn't earn and are simply because of who they are. And so it's important that we don't just that we don't ignore the top of the coin and think about our own social location as well. Because oftentimes we, we think about the bottom of the coin. So we really have to think about critical reflexive practice and how that influences the way you approach engagement, the way you approach a research question, how all of these things come together. And, uh, and so as a healthcare researcher, as a healthcare um, clinician, as a patient partner, sometimes we just start out with some personal individual questions where we talk about, you know, thinking about what are my own personal values and experiences and interests and beliefs and political commitments in the area of health we will be researching or working in. How do these personal experiences relate to socially constructed locations and processes of oppression in the area of health we will be researching or working in? So really thinking about how your own social location may impact the way you're viewing um, a, a research question or approaching an engagement practice as well. And then thinking more as a team uh, how can we become more aware of and take advantage of opportunities where we can challenge each other's ideas and renegotiate power within our team? What does resilience look like, feel like, and mean to you? And how do you think we can make sure that everyone's perspectives are included and that we address health inequities as well as issues of social justice? And so we actually have a booklet that I can send a, send a link to as well that helps you go through these questions, both as individuals and then as a team as well. Oh, here is the booklet <laughs> that I was talking about. And it's the readiness to engage work booklet. 
So safety and trustworthiness play a really important part in trauma-informed engagement. And what this really means is taking the time to build relationships at the beginning of any uh, research project. So being really flexible and adaptable when it comes to meetings, allowing time for storytelling and allowing time for things like laughter and just a personal connection. <clears throat> We oftentimes tell teams to prepare to have a few of the initial meetings completely dedicated to relationship building. And one thing a lot of our teams have started doing is how, starting any type of engagement with a conversation around safety, because how we define safety and what we think is safety, it really varies uh, from person to person. And some people may even say there is no such thing as safety. So having this conversation up front is really important in developing kind of that conversation and some guiding principles for your group. So first of all, we go through each, so physical, emotional, psychological, cultural, and spiritual. So when we talk about what does physical safety mean to you, look like to you, and feel like to you, Examples might be choosing to meet in a community setting versus an academic or hospital or healthcare setting, creating warm and welcoming spaces, and meeting people where they're at. When we start talking about emotional, psychological safety, what does it mean to you? What does it look like to you? What does it feel like to you? Examples might be kind of conversations around really having a collective commitment to the belief in the resiliency and strength of both individuals and communities. The idea that recovery uh, from trauma and healing is possible and that the answers often lie within individuals and communities. And it can also include conversations around the importance of bearing witness, what that means, uh, allowing space for people to share their stories, upholding that space for one another, actively listening and reflecting, uh, sitting in non-judgment of the coping and adaptation skills that, that people may take on in response to trauma, all of these things. And it's really moving away from what's wrong with you to have you had any life experiences that have impacted your health and well-being. Uh, so reframing things to start coming to things at a strength-based uh, aspect. And then when we talk about cultural safety, what does it mean to you, look like to you, and feel like to you? Examples might be kind of on a commitment to ongoing critical reflexive practice as individual team members, but also as a group. So maybe team members may, may have... A, each have journals that they can reflect on after meetings and after engagement events, but they can also have time within meetings to have uh, some conversations about how things are going. A commitment to anti-racism and anti-oppressive training and practice and really continuing to learn about um, things like colonialism within health institutions. When we talk about what does spiritual safety mean to you, look like to you and feel like to you, it can include things like having time before meetings for those interested in coming together, say with an elder, or integrating ceremonial aspects within your engagement practice. And through these discussions, you can start building um, guiding principles for your team. And what I've realized is every time we have this conversation, each team comes up with completely different responses and completely different guiding principles, which really speaks to that idea that how we define it and view it uh, differs from person to person. But the good thing is when you build these guiding principles, it's a place where the group can go back to, but it also gives a common language to address when there are issues coming up, when there are um, power imbalances that need to be addressed. You can always signal, let's go, can we have a conversation about our guiding principles? And so it really gives um, everyone on the team an opportunity to to address things that might be coming up in uh, in an engagement practice. What is the difference between unsafe and uncomfortable? I'll open this up to our chat box again. Um, 
to see if people might have Oh, these are good ones. I can see other people. There's so many good responses going on here. Right. I, I did. I know, notice um, one person said it's important to bear in mind that some risk of re-traumatization will still be there despite our best efforts and be prepared to face such an adverse event as researchers. That's right. And we're going to talk about uh, that in a little bit of how you can um, create your engagement strategy in a way that's going to be able to respond to some of that. Uh, unsafe, no boundaries. Uh, some people are able to tolerate discomfort. Oh, unsafe microaggressions, zero accountability. Potential for harm versus potentially unpleasant moments. These are all good, good answers, everyone. This is a great group. You guys are like <laughs> the game. So when we build guiding principles for our group, the good thing is it also, we also take a moment to talk about the difference between safety and comfort. Um, and it's a really important uh, conversation to have to distinguish between the two. So there are times when people may think, uh, whether you're a researcher, a healthcare clinician, a patient partner and so on, that um, safe spaces mean you can feel comfortable to express yourself and not be judged. Uh, but if you do say something that causes harm to someone else, so if you say something that is racist or sexist or homophobic or ableist or sizist or ageist or classist, any of these things, you will be called out. And it will be uncomfortable being called out, but it's not unsafe. What would be unsafe would be to not address it uh, immediately uh, because we really want in all of our engagement strategies to model that idea that if someone is being harmed, that we are there to support and that we are going to back that up. And so it can be uncomfortable. Um, this is a guide from the Harvard Diversity, Inclusion and Belonging group, and it's talk, it talks about calling in versus calling out. And these are two types of practices. So when someone says something harmful to another person, uh, you can either call them in or you can call them out. So when someone causes harm, calling out means bringing public attention to an individual group or organization for harmful words or behaviors. Uh, calling in is an invitation to one-on-one -on -one small group conversation to bring attention to an individual group's harmful words or behavior, including bias, prejudice, microaggressions, or discrimination. And the reasons that we want to do this uh, whether it's calling in or calling out, is we want to stop the perpetuation and negative effects of harmful words or behaviors. We want to create a compassionate space and we want to le lean into having tough conversations because that's the part of relationship building, right? And, and in engagement, the primacy of relationship building is, is so important. Some of the considerations when you're thinking about calling in and calling out, um, if you're looking at long-term relationships, that might mean you're thinking about calling in. If you're thinking about this as a one-time interaction or engagement, it might mean calling out um, the urgency of the situation and so on. So calling out, here's some examples of what it might sound. So this is when someone has said something harmful and you wanna just call them out right away. That's not our culture here. That's not our values. Uh, another one is, it sounded like you said blank. Is that what you really meant? Um, I need to push back against that. I disagree. I don't see it that way. I need you to know how that comment just landed with me. It sounds like you're making some assumptions that we need to unpack a bit. Calling in 
So this is when you want people to lean into the difficult conversation and have a more fulsome conversation. I'm curious, what was your intention when you said that? Uh, how might the impact of your words or actions differ from your intent? How might someone else see this differently? Is it possible that someone else might misinterpret your words or actions? Why do you think that is the case? Why do you believe that this, that this is to be true? In some of the ways I know when we're doing engagement and facilitating, some of the things that we try to do is criticize the behavior. So what someone has said, call it out. Uh, and not get into the personal to the person and just be really specific like this thing that you just said uh, try not to get into kind of condescending um, decide whether to call in or call out and that's a that's kind of one of those decisions you have to uh, think about in the moment and then hope for the best but maybe it might mean that there's going to be some disruption or conflict within the group when you are called out or in. So this is if someone actually, if you say something that's harmful and you may have had the best intentions, you may have come in that day and like had no idea what you were saying, but you've said something, it's caused harm and you've been called out. You need to pause. You need to listen really, really closely to what people are saying to you and not um, try to get into an argument or be defensive. You have to acknowledge that what you said was harmful and then reflect and apologize. And then the best, the best way to repair things is not to repeat the harm. So it's on you to go away and learn more about what uh, you said that was harmful and, and read more and, list, and, and start educating yourself more. So some additional ways to integrate trauma-informed engagement into practice. So we've done a lot of the kind of individual critical reflexive practice, and we've done some of the interpersonal interactions. What are some ways that we can start setting up, um, setting up things in a different way? I'm just gonna see, sorry, I'm checking the chat box because they're, Oh, Angela did, Angela has a good one. So being the person who felt harm may not feel comfortable calling out or saying anything. And this needs to be considered too. That is a really good point, Angela. And I think that's on all team members then to be able to call out, right? It's not on the person who's been harmed to necessarily call out um, someone uh, who's who said something harmful, but rather if you really want to model an engagement strategy um, that that is compassionate and empathetic, you need to be able and willing to call out people when they are doing harm. And that could be when you're facilitating an engagement practice or as a researcher when you're leading it as well. Oops, sorry. Du -du -du. And Carolyn, sorry, there was another nice question here oh, from Rachel yeah. Roden in the chat. In the chat, I'm not sure if you saw that one. I haven't seen that one. Do you want me to read it for you, Carolyn? That Just would be a lot. <laughs> We're very That'd active awesome. here. <laughs> um, it says, is one better than the other, calling in versus calling out? I worry that not calling out could be viewed as allowing harmful behavior to continue in a group. Absolutely. And I even see, like, calling in... Um, an opportunity as well. I know we say kind of to take someone aside, but I actually see calling in if you have developed kind of guiding principles within your team that you can call people in uh, in a group situation as well. So lean into that uncomfortable and use some of those phrases like, you know what, uh, this this sounds like you might have meant something else and and please kind of elaborate on that. So um, I always think that calling in uh, can be done still in a in that group situation because the importance of being able to lean into uncomfortable conversations 
as well as part of the relationship building and see and other people seeing that you're willing to have that conversation and build that, uh, I think is really important. <clears throat> Was there any other? There's a really good one from Maureen Smith. And I don't know, Maureen, if you were comfortable going on camera or if you wanted me to read it out for you. <laughs> yeah, sure. I'm I'm I so thank you, Carolyn. This is like an incredible presentation. So I was in a meeting and someone else made a statement that was I thought was totally inappropriate. And the person to react. And so I kind of called it out, not to the person, but called out that kind of statement. But it was got turned against me. And it was like that person didn't really interpret it that way and then called me out. So oh. since then, I've been nervous about like advocating, you know, on someone else's behalf, or because I now I'm now I wonder, well, is it just me? Or, you know, should I just mind my own business? But I feel so strongly about meeting places that are, you know, that we try to create a safe space. So do you have any advice? Like, how do you how do you judge um, when the other person like, doesn't react and you feel that maybe you should say something how do yeah. you do that and I think yeah it's it's wonderful that you did call out and sometimes I think it's that that statement from uh, the Harvard group that says plan you know plan for the best but expect the worst or something like that sometimes things can and and of course that's where that uncomfortable versus comfortable so someone being called out so can sometimes try to flip flip it and say that well that wasn't my intention and you're making me feel and say so they can try to flip that conversation um but I think it I think that's wonderful that you did it and I hope you continue to like call out to to stand up as an ally um and yeah sometimes I think some of the best kind of responses kind of can be like it may not have been your uh, your intent but the way in which you said this landed in a certain way and could be perceived as harmful. And, and it's really kind of just pushing back a, against that a little bit. But I think it it's messy, right? It's that whole part of engagement <laughs> that that we continue to, you know, grapple in, in our inter in any relationships really. But I think it, what you it would have been easier for me if the person who said the statement came back at me like I was ready for that but it wasn't yeah. that person it was the person who the statement was aimed at who basically said I didn't take it that way at all I didn't think there was anything wrong with that so like I was ready for the other way to go but I wasn't ready for the person who I thought I was maybe defending yeah. so that's what's made me nervous because I'm not afraid to stand up to somebody if I make a statement I'll you know I, I could have but then I thought oh I probably did the wrong thing like I like so now I've been kind of nervous because now I'm trying to evaluate whether that person actually was harmed I thought it was very harmful like I I wouldn't have jumped in unless I thought it was really harmful I thought it was really harmful so anyways that that's so that like I wasn't expecting those tables to turn that way so that's yeah. where I that that's that's where I wondered if you had some advice like what do you do in your head like do you do you kind of try to assess the situation and just kind of wait or you know I didn't know what to do it's always in that spur of the moment right <laughs> where you're you're trying to assess like should this be a conversation where I pull someone aside or has someone really said something harmful that we need to like say address immediately and to the point, and I think it's, yeah, it's to each of our own, our own judgment. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily feel like, yeah, I think you, you felt, felt, uh, felt that it was important. Juliet, I see your hand up. Yeah, when you're finished. <laughs> oh, go ahead. <laughs> okay. um, so I wanted to add, so I was in a situation uh, about five years ago, I was actually, it was actually an EDI training workshop and something happened during the workshop and the leaders, the facilitators of the workshop used that event. I think they spoke to the person first and I hopefully got their permission to talk about it, but basically they call the person up and they then, they then used what happened to further 
explain and reinforce why certain behaviors, et cetera, um, weren't appropriate as well as what our unconscious biases were. Because basically as a facilitator, they themselves had done something unconsciously and this other person was also, so it was a very interesting way that he turned something that could have been really negative and left people feeling horribly at the end of the whole workshop. He turned it into a learning opportunity for everyone in a non-judgmental, non-traumatic um, um, way. So that's just okay. something, up, but it requires skill. And he had the skill to do that. I love that idea of calling people up and then using it as like a learning opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's a wonderful, thanks for sharing that, Julia. That, uh, that is another way of, of addressing it. That, that um... Yeah, because many of us, we watched what happened, but it didn't register to any of us that we were also biased and we just accepted what happened. Right. So, so he uh, turned it, he turned it around and, and, and told us and reminded us of what had happened and said, and no one commented other than this one person to him privately. And that's when then he challenged all of us to, you know, to think about the fact that we accepted what happened without even seeing our biases in what had happened. It's amazing. So. That is, and it takes a great deal of humility and vulnerability to, to be able to then kind of bring it back yeah. as an educational opportunity and that yeah. that shows kind of the messiness of engage but also like that is how you build yeah. trusting relationships is by yeah. having those tougher conversations yeah no it was very powerful it was definitely powerful yeah that's amazing thanks so much for sharing that there's some more activity in the chat carolyn if i think we have some time right yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I love your laid back style. It's really great. Um, so, um, so there was a lot of discussion about Angela when she was saying, um, and Angela, do you want to actually share? You have a lot, you have a lot in the chat here. Do you want to share some of your really incredible points? And sorry if well, I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> I can try. Yeah. Um, because I do Indigenous cultural safety training. Um, sorry, my video didn't come back up. Um, I do Indigenous cultural safety training. I've taken, much like Juliet was saying, I've had to take anti-bias, anti-oppression, because everywhere we work, they want you to do that. I teach it. Um, and so, and I experience it. So while I'm fairer skin doesn't mean that I don't experience it. So as a made vulnerable person, and that is the language I use. I refuse to use racialized. I refuse to use marginalized. I did not put myself in this position. Western uh, structures have put me here. So we have to also wa watch the languages that we're using, because as soon as you say that marginalized group, that oppressed group, you've automatically vilified us and made us into the place that oh we got to correct them they need a fix that's not what we're asking for we're asking for equity and so there's a difference between the ways that you talk about things but often what I notice is it's not what is said it's the you know the eye roll the sigh the uh, unimpressed gaze, or, you know, sometimes it's the words. Um, I, when you start talking about how made vulnerable people specifically in research uh, react to Western ways, Western methodologies, um, people freak out. And so what I'm trying to get at is there's sometimes not a way to call these things out or, you know, call them up. It's more somebody in that that space has to say, wait, I didn't understand what you said, or I didn't understand why you had a reaction to that. And it doesn't mean that you're calling it out on my behalf. You're calling it out just in general because you've noticed somebody's reaction. And so the reason I say this is because it's in those moments when people are most hurt. Yeah. So if nobody says anything to the big eye roll after I say something, I, yeah, I can be hurt, but I'm also not going to call it out because I don't want to, because being the made vulnerable person in the room, and often I'm the only one, 
uh, people take that as me trying to start a fight, being, you know, the troublemaker because I'm the EDI person in the room. And, you know, we're at every table because they, the tables always make sure there's one person from an EDI seeking group, right? That's the way it is. So when I think about patients and I was, I can't even remember what I was looking at. They talked about all of the isms, but when I, it was somebody's report. I can't remember if it was Kai High or World Health or whatever. They say ableism in the beginning and then they never talk about it again. So again, even when you call it out, they go, oh, we just happen to have forgotten it. That's not acceptable. Yeah. We have to take the time and remember these things. And that's what I was trying to get at. So if we're not doing the due diligence at the beginning, then everything else is doomed to fail afterwards. Absolutely. Oh, that's such a great point, Angela. Thank you so much for sharing that. That is really, and it's interesting. Um, I was thinking about how there's been groups before when we've done engagement, when we talk about um, physical safety, there have been groups that have actually identified arm crossing, uh, rolling of the eyes, those types of things as things that we, they want on the guiding principles that they can then call people out as a group, right? And so that kind of um, sitting in non-judgment and really like using strengths-based and resiliency-based aspects of it, approaching things that way. And so that's, but that is such an important part and that it's on all of us to watch each other too, to, to make sure that they're there yeah that we are calling those things out those physical cues as well and then the language part is another big one too uh, that's important to talk about as well those are great wow there's so many great uh great points being made yeah and some also carolyn we have some suggestions on different ways to in like this slide <laughs> yeah, i know we're kind of people are going it not yeah good. Did you want us to invite some of those people to share some of their 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 um, thoughts on this? Absolutely. So Joanne, you made a really great point in the the chat about the double burden. Did you want to talk a little mm. bit about that? Um, sorry. Or I can read it for you. I can read yeah. it. <laughs> I, I yeah, I recall. Um, it really I think puts a, the the public page part in, in a no win position. Uh, it, you're, you know, you're already going in uh, vulnerable, and I think every patient partner wants to give. It's a way of dealing with all the bad behavior that they've been victim to, um, and uh, it, it's a double. It's a double burden. Even the whole complaint um, system structure, I find very. It's it's not user friendly because it's the the one who's been victim of the complaint that has to go through like hoops um, to to get a straight answer. I the systems are so large and there's so little accountability. It's um, sorry, it's so depressing. I should have come up with a solution for this, but um, I think again, it's often about the person. There are people who are seem genuinely interested in being. Uh, humble and listening they're also caught usually in a large system so there's a limit to what they can do and then there are other people who are just completely unacceptable um and think it's really no big deal and don't understand what it's like to have this lived experience who have gained it the whole process i think to me going through these really difficult um events builds resilience anyway i could go on forever but uh, I don't, I don't believe resilience can be bestowed on anybody. I think it's built from just go, doing the hard work, unfortunately. And sometimes I can, you know, thank a lot of people who are really, really mean to me because um, it's given me some um, grounding to, to just keep going. It, it's sort of counterintuitive. You've been thrown down, hit down so many times. Like, how can you just get up again? Sometimes I can't. Um, and then that passes and then I'll get up again and, and listening to other people's experiences and, and the support um, through this 
new, I think, uh, you know, the evidence aligns what they're doing is, um, that's what helps me get through. It. Thank you. That's real. Thank you so much for sharing that, Joanne. And and it and it shows just the importance of of team members really recognizing the resiliency that people have that are that that are coming to join and understanding and and giving space for people to share those experiences, making space within the research process for sharing those experiences. Excellent. And um, Yasmin talked a little bit about allies and advocates, and maybe we can invite her to um, to build on that a little bit, if comfortable. Yeah, absolutely. So we always talk in the literature about the minority tax, like that you have to uh, endure the racism, the microaggression, and at the same time, you have to be uh, advocating for your rights and you have to stand up for yourself. But having allies and advocates from other people who are not marginalized or minorities or, or whatever can be a great way to alleviate this burden on um, the minorities and people who go through um, discrimination experiences. Um, so yeah, that was my point. <laughs> That's such a that's such an important point to make as well to understand that that's a key part of the relationship building as well as building those advocates and those those people who will be able to step up for you as well. Yeah, thank you so much. And Mike Scott um, was talking about safety, patience, and understanding. Sorry, Mike, I'm put, I'm putting everyone on the spot. <laughs> Would you like to elaborate on that? Uh, yes. So I think, you know, everyone's always safety first. And yes, that's a great golden rule. But also patience and understanding uh, should also be part of that first step. So that instead of, you know, jumping out and calling someone out, um, we think about maybe what their experience might be that brings them to um, their statements and, you know, call them in instead, or uh, make uh, choices based on first safety and learning to consider the situation and understand the situation. Yeah, I think that's a great, that's a great point to make. I remember a team once, they were amazing. They came in the room and just said, I may mess up. Like I, I may say something at some point in time and I want you to feel comfortable enough to to say something to me and there it, we're all going to as part of any relationship that we have right we may mess up sometimes and we may say things and it's really important that is what happens next right what we do next that really counts and tomorrow sure. yeah go ahead <laughs> So I think, um, so thank you, Carolyn. I like the distinction between calling in and calling out. And I think your comments around relationships um, being really important when making the decision about which approach to take. Um, because I could see just from personal experience, I'm being completely honest, um, <laughs> where I have um, called people out for saying things that were in my opinion, offensive or problematic to um, our partners, be they community partners or academic partners and feeling comfortable um, enough to call people out and then experiencing that relationships were affected um, mm -hmm. because people felt personally attacked. And so I find that now, and maybe it's, maybe it's a little bit of age and, um, <laughs> and life experience, um, but I find that now I'm more likely to call people in um, or do a call out indirectly. So probably five or 10 minutes into the future, make a comment um, that implicitly references the item or the, um, the offensive comment that was made earlier. Um, and then I found that the person who was, um, who was harmed by that comment would come up to me after and say, thank you for doing that. Um, but it doesn't put anyone on the spot and it, um, it raises the issue. In my opinion, it, I find that it raises the issue without 
the other person becoming defensive. And I find that sometimes when another person becomes defensive, others in the room tend to shy down. Very rarely do I see many people kind of stepping up. Um, and so I find that calling in and maybe a subtle calling out separated um, in time from the initial event, um, I find that those approaches tend to work, at least for me. Thanks so much for sharing. That is a great, yeah, that's a great piece of advice as well. It's like calling in, but kind of in a way that's not um, completely <laughs> directed towards, but really at addressing and showing that it's being addressed um, to people who may have been harmed in the group as well, that it's not being let go, but at the same time, it, it creates that space. That's a great suggestion. Um, and Sherry Logan did a great job answering this question. I don't know if Sherry wanted, or if you want Sherry, if you prefer, I'm happy to read your comment. In the um, yeah. So yeah, I was just, I was just mentioning that um, it's in relation to a conference, a medical conference I was at recently and um, it was included patient engagement. And so I actually witnessed uh, a, a patient re-traumatized and some of the things in reflection of being at that conference, because I'm a patient myself, and I remember the first conference I went to, I actually experienced the exact same thing and completely forgot, you know, that newness of all the information and how it relates to you and your child and being reflective. Um, so, you know, some of the things that we came up with as we started to debrief as a group was like the importance of supportive resources available to parent or to patients. Um, debrief with patients, create supportive closing spaces, and open up for sharing um, because others probably feel a similar way as you do. Those are all great, great suggestions. I love those. Yeah, those are very important. Excellent. And also, we had a really nice comment here from Amanda Doherty Kirby. If, if you would be comfortable, Amanda, um, talking a little bit about this. I, I am. Um, I am of the mind that when I know better, I do better. So that's to me where the accountability piece comes in. I can make a mistake, but I want to be called out in or up whatever needs to be said to me so that I can examine it and learn. That's how I learned about microaggressions in the first place, because I didn't understand. And that came from a, where I came from. It, the com comment wouldn't have been considered as such, but it's not the intent. It's the impact, right? Um, and also, I think the idea that the hurt person is the one that has to complain or initiate change is already drilled into our kids from a young age. Here, it's actually educational policy that the person that gets bullied has to to report the bullying or nothing gets done. So I think we need to start, like we're talking in research spaces, but we also need to talk earlier as well. Yeah, I agree. Thank you so much for sharing that, Amanda. And I, I don't know if Carolyn is, um, looks like she might be frozen right now, but I do want to share also the importance of having close colleagues that, um, and creating the space that they can share with you and give you that feedback, Amanda. So being open to that feedback and also creating the space for them. So I do want to give a huge shout out to uh, Dr. Linda Lee. I don't know if she's still on the line, uh, but I remember just to share a personal uh, story when we first started doing patient engagement, and I didn't know what the heck I was doing, you know, at the start, no idea. And Linda, like, had a little chat with me afterwards and said, you know, some of the things, and I was not intending to offend anyone, but she said, you know, a couple things that you mentioned uh, rubbed, you know, some of the patient partners in a wrong way. And I was just like, I felt so bad, like, oh, my gosh, you know <laughs> what, like, you know, I'm not trying to hurt anyone's feelings or, you know, but, but, and she explained it to me in such a lovely way, Linda, I don't know if you remember this, <laughs> maybe you do, <laughs> but she was so kind and like, very, like, very compassionate towards me and just saying, you know, we have to start like from a place of relationships and, and this and that, and, and just having those close colleagues that can like call you out in a very nice, gentle way. And I didn't feel threatened in any way or anything. And Linda, 
I was like, okay, Linda, help me. I have no idea what I'm doing, you know? <laughs> and sometimes the patients want to hear that. Like when we're, you're starting to engage with them, you want to say, listen, this is my first time. We've heard that as a suggestion from patient and public partners. This is my first time engaging as a researcher. I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm a little out of my depths, but I have good intentions and I want to try. Um, but yeah, like I think the importance of having coaches. So like Dr. Lee was my coach at the beginning <laughs> and, um, you know, having them, come to meetings with you and give you feedback and suggestions, but also as researchers for us to be open to it and having that two-way dialogue is just really important. I don't know, Linda, I'm putting you on the spot. I don't know if you want to add to, to that or, you know, if there was anything you wanted to mention about this topic. Andrea, it's really kind for you to say that. And I think credit to you that you create a really safe place for me to be able to reach out to you. It's not easy to call in or call out because it's some of the um, it, uh, uh, individuals also mentioned that, you know, you put yourself at risk when you're calling people in or calling people out. And so credit really to you as the leader that created a space for individuals like myself as a member of the Alliance coming forward and have a conversation with you. So thank you for allowing me to do that. And it's nice for you to say, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, no, it's it's really great. And I think as researchers, we have to rely on our more senior <laughs> colleagues to help us or the ones who have the experience and ex expertise working in the area to, you know, and creating the space so that they can feel free to, um, you know, share things with us and let us know for our own learning, like as to what Amanda was saying, coming from a place of a growth mindset, you know, I'm not perfect, far from perfect. My my 15 year old teenage son tells me every day I'm not perfect. Uh, so he keeps me very grounded. And, you know, coming from a growth mindset, Amanda would know she has six kids, but coming from a growth mindset where, you know, we are all learning together and, and growing together on this journey. So yeah, I think it's really great. And I don't know what happened to Carolyn. Are you back? I'm so, oh, no. so sorry. My computer completely died. <laughs> talking, about, uh, talking about things going it's all wrong. Good. <laughs> it's all good. I had I took it as an opportunity to share a lived experience, Carolyn. So I hope that's okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. I yeah. am so, so sorry about that. Yeah, no, no, my pleasure. My pleasure. So I don't know. Uh, there are more things in the chat, Carolyn, but... I don't know how we're doing for time. If you wanted to continue and maybe we go back to the chat at the end, you yeah. know, what do you, what do you think it's up to you? Whatever maybe, you yeah. maybe we can come back to the chat okay. in a little Perfect. bit and, and see if there's any more things that resonate with people as we go through. Okay. Perfect. So people, I think a, a lot of you had some really awesome ideas about additional ways to integrate trauma-informed engagement. I really love that. Um, so some of the ones uh, around uh, safety and trustworthiness and, and building that kind of space for people. Uh, sorry, I'm just like testing myself. <laughs> in the moment here. So welcoming introductions is always a really important part, really emphasizing that of the primacy of the relationship building aspect, right? Sometimes as you know, if you're a researcher, you want to get right into it and like, run the meeting almost like a research meeting, but really taking the time to, to do make some of those guiding principles, have those conversations, even having those conversations out front about unsafe versus, um, versus uncomfortable can help us then, everyone knows then that there's a possibility of being called out and that this is a space that we're gonna lean into tough conversations and support one another. Adapting the physical and online space uh, so just like choosing a physical meeting space is really important. Thinking about if you're doing online engagement, having one-on-one -on -one conversations with people about things like, do you have a space in your home that is safe for you to have this conversation? Do you have the technology to connect and having, and even thinking about, uh, community organizations where there may be quiet spaces that people can go to. Um, also, I think someone had mentioned before having a quiet room or having a space uh, that people can go to. I know conferences are now starting to have quiet rooms, which I really appreciate. 
Um, but you can also have a breakout room that people can go to should they need a few moments um, to speak with someone or just to have a decompress a little bit as well. Things like providing clear and accessible information are, is such an important aspect and we don't always think about it because when we think about the idea of powerlessness and not being able to have control, really thinking about providing people with all the information that they need, but also meeting people where they're at. Um, someone had mentioned an experience around uh, a conference and being kind of overwhelmed with information. We have a group, um, a methamphetamine in Manitoba group that has people with lived and living experience, as well as data scientists and we had an experience once when we were at the interpretation of the research phase where researchers just wanted to present the findings. So this is this is the stats that we got from from uh, looking at mental health and the association with methamphetamine. And it took a moment for people to step back and say, you are presenting numbers that have a relevance. <laughs> to people's lives. So the way in which we can engage people might be different. And so we actually changed it around to a storytelling method where we said, numbers tell a story. They don't tell us the full story. What, what story are the numbers saying? Does it resonate with your own lived and living experience? What story is not being told? And so that was the way in which people could actually inform decision making around the interpretation phase. So really thinking about the impact of the things that you might be presenting to people and finding a way to engage people and meet them where they're at is such an important part. Ensuring everyone understands confidentiality, of course, this is a really important one. Creating a crisis plan if a person is in distress. So anytime we do engagement, we always have a list of resources, free, low cost, accessible resources on hand that should someone need a little bit of um, additional support afterwards, we can give, we actually, a lot of times we'll provide it with the handbook, the engagement materials at the very beginning. So you have it on hand, but you can also do things like um, sit with someone and if while they're making an appointment um, and just support them should they need some, some additional resources. Things like demonstrating predictable expectations and scheduling meetings consistently, these are really important, if, especially if you've had boundary violations and you've had kind of um, different experiences like that. It's really important in building a relationship with people that you demonstrate consistent behavior around engagement. And then choice and collaboration is one of the most important parts because experiences of trauma can leave people feeling really powerless, having had little choice or control over what happened and possibly what they've done. It's essential that any trauma informed engagement really forefronts choice and collaboration all the way through. So offering choice whenever possible gives control and, and and gives control back to partners as well. So even how people prefer to be contacted, who will be involved in certain decisions, how budgets should be allocated, what prior, to talking to people about what their personal priorities and goals are for the project. And that, and really collaboration, meaning talking about sharing expertise and sharing power and thinking about those things brainstorming how to address barriers to engagement. So if there are there, you know, what if any obstacles do you foresee uh, in getting to the engagement activities or connecting back with your community? So really brain having conversation one on one conversations with people to address any type of barriers to engagement that might happen. Eliciting people's priorities and hopes. So having individual conversations around what people's priorities and hopes are and making sure that you actually bring that into the conversation around engagement, right? So that the choice and collaboration is still at the forefront. Inquiring about others who may be helpful to include in some aspects of engagement. So sometimes people may want to have a personal support with them, a friend, a family, that's okay. And who, who would help, you know, having those conversations is really important as well. Um, using statements that make collaboration 
uh, and choice explicit. So I'd really like to understand your perspective. Let's look at this together. Uh, let's figure out a plan that will work best for you. Uh, what's most important for you that we should start with? Um, what's most, um, it, it, it's, a, it's really important to us that we get your feedback on every step of the process. Uh, so just really being explicit with the fact that we want to collaborate and that choice is always an aspect. And then uh, listening purposefully uh, people's perspectives all the way through and finding ways to meet people where they're at, where they can engage and, and, and give those types of, that type of feedback. Grounding techniques. A lot of you have probably heard about grounding. I, I mentioned a few before, but this is should someone in a moment um, be triggered. Um, <clears throat> there's a number of different ones and it really personally uh, works. Certain ones work with uh, some people and it's a real personal decision, but things like getting people a glass of water and having them sip a cold glass of water uh, taking deep breaths, focusing on an object, repeating a mantra, or even having a conversation name something you can see, smell, touch, hear, and taste. And the whole point of grounding is just to get people back into the present should they experience a trigger uh, during um, during one of the one of the engagements. But it's just good to have a few of these things on hand um, in the back of your mind when you are doing engagement. And then the importance of bearing witness. It's really important um, to be able to hold up space for people to tell uh, their stories. Um, I know a lot of people sometimes feel kind of um, hesitant or nervous about doing that, but really uh, we bear witness to people's stories. We bear witness to friends and family and coworkers. We look at art, we watch movies, we read books, we bear witness to people's stories all the time. And so, so really thinking about that. Um, so when you're thinking about where, bearing witness, it's really about reflexive listening. Um, so making sure that you understand what people are saying, um, acknowledging, uh, acknowledging strength and and um, people may tell their stories for a number of reasons and it's not just to inform the research process it may be a valuable way for them to process their experience it may be obtaining some empathy and support from the team lightening their load as well so understanding that they're it's, it's a give and take process and that it's <clears throat> mutually beneficial <clears throat> and then Oh, yeah, that's the, the part of sharing stories. And then really making sure that we we support people by giving uh, positive affirmation. So really acknowledging um, people's effort and strength and resiliency, offering appreciation and understanding, recognizing success. So things like you've been through so much in your life and through the engagement that you're doing right now. Um, you're try you you can make sure that things are different for the next generation. Um, no matter what, you don't give up. Um, and just really recognizing when people are telling um, telling their story, acknowledging the strength that comes with that. Right? It's not an easy thing. And then empathy. Um, a great way of thinking about empathy, because sometimes we think about it in terms of, of being in someone else's shoes, but really what it is, is listening really closely to someone telling a story. Think about what, <clears throat> kind of identify what feeling that they, they, what feeling was going on with them. And then think about a time that you felt that too, right? So you may have felt loss or sadness or powerlessness or grief at one point in time. And then you're really saying, um, you know, I really value your, you're really essentially saying that must have been tough. I've felt that before. I may not have experienced what you went through, but I felt that that must have been really tough. That must have been frustrating. Um, acknowledging that strength and really letting someone know how valued they are and that they are being listened to as well. 
And then boundaries are prerequisite for compassion and empathy. So we can't connect with people without also thinking about boundaries. And that's where some of the guiding principles can come into hand. Uh, having those conversations about uncomfortable and safe really is it's important for people when you want to feel safe you need to know what's okay and what's not okay so setting boundaries and having those conversations are actually really a part of compassion and empathy as well when you're doing engagement um i think someone once said clear is kind unclear is is unkind so really being sure that people understand and then last but not least, something we don't talk about in health research uh, very often um, is self-care. So really thinking about how you can integrate self-care into your daily routine. So grounding techniques that we just talked about, those are ways that you can integrate self-care. Having a variety in your day and role. So if you're going to an engagement event, maybe you need some quiet time that day or you need to schedule some different activities during that day. Uh, we used to sometimes have a number of engagement events one after the other and realizing that people need to debrief and decompress. Um, attending continuing education sessions on things like mindfulness-based stress reduction techniques, taking scheduled breaks throughout your day for things like reflection and socializing, exercise, eating, or just to get away from a work task, uh, developing a personal debriefing plan. So debriefing is one of the critical parts I should have mentioned before. But it's really important to, to have a debrief scheduled, both with partners with lived and living experience. So giving them a call afterwards and asking them how, how they think the engagement went, uh, but also even amongst uh, other research or having a supervisor or someone that you can have a debriefing plan or other peers, um, just setting that up in advance um, to be in your schedule after the engagement really can help um, or else sometimes things get in the way and we don't end up debriefing and then we don't have that chance to kind of really reflect on, on the engagement process. And then setting realistic goals for yourself, that idea where we, we will mess up sometimes and we just got to be humble and, um, and think about ways that we can, uh, we can do better. And then, uh, oh, one of the last things we always do when we are doing engagement, um, we, our wrap up uh, thing, uh, our wrap up activity is always name one thing that you're going to do for yourself tonight, something good that you're going to do for yourself tonight or this week. And what that does is really recenter everyone on thinking about one kind of self care. And it can be something like just watching Netflix or, you know, getting a cup of tea something just to recenter and have make sure that we all have something that we're going to do afterwards and so those are some of the big ones <laughs> i can open it up to questions again because i know we have a lot going on Thank you so much, Carolyn. Yeah, we, I mean, lots of amazing engagement in, in the text. So, and I do think we have a bit more time. So maybe we can continue if you're okay. We're not we're <laughs> checking in with you as well, <laughs> you know, to make sure you're okay to keep going. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so I'm just gonna read out some of, uh, just call on a few people. So Safa, you had mentioned about coming from a place of empathy. Did you want to elaborate on that in the chat? I can even stop there. Sure. Um, that came from Mike's comment um, where, you know, making sure before calling out, um, kind of taking a moment to understand where the other person's coming from. Um, you know, perhaps they've also been triggered in some way. Um, so just coming from a place of empathy. And I think um, that kind of applies to, and I said this also in the comment that I'm, I'm learning so much from this, not just for patient engagement, but for my own personal life. Um, and like, there's also the part where you said bearing witness. I was just, everything you've been saying, I've been taking it in. I was like, I... I just want to text my friends and just be like, I have learned so much. There's just so much coming out of this. And I thank you so much. So yeah, I think it's very important. 
Thanks so much, Safa. And those are really good points to around taking the time sometimes to just reflect on on uh, where people are coming from as well when we do the calling in and calling out and the um, and the idea that sometimes it's not people it's not a person's intention it comes out and just really understanding that it's addressing the behavior or something that they said versus like going for the per and like yeah having that empathy and understanding it's so important Yes, and Yasmin um, had a very nice comment about um, uh, sometimes feeling like the researchers know more or their health professional, professionals know better than the patient. So Yasmin, did you want to talk a little bit about this dismantling that you wrote about in the chat? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I work with doctors and I see that sometimes their ego um can make them intimidating to uh, patients. And I can't imagine a patient working uh, close to uh, a doctor who has been practicing for many years and he thinks that he knows everything. Um, so I, I think before thinking about trauma-informed engagement, uh, there has to be something around this, like this colonialism mentality uh, the 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 uh, the imbalance in power and uh, the idea that uh, I know everything and I'm better than you I know that I I know more than you and what you need is something that we have to address before uh, even the trauma informed uh, engagement. Yeah, thanks. absolutely. I definitely agree with you, Yasmin. I think it always starts at the individual where there has to be some critical reflexive practice around the idea of expertise. And I know the, the yeah, the trouble sometimes is that within academia and within medical, like that you have to be seen as the expert in something. And to be able to go and do engagement, you really have to start taking apart that idea that you are an expert in that um, and really starting to think about the value of experiential knowledge and that it's on par with other types of knowledge. Um, so really understanding that there, there are multiple different knowledges and ways of knowing that need to be respected and valued within that space. Great. Um, thank you, Carolyn. And Angela was talking about, um, well, a couple things. I'm sorry, Angela, I keep putting you on the spot just because I think we can all learn from you. And I always learn from everything that you say. <laughs> so I love this helicopter research. Can you expand on that a little bit? And also talking about the, like how to, to work with people with lived experience? Uh, okay. So <laughs> In Indigenous communities, we often joke that we have an anthropologist in our back pocket, each and every one of us, because we've been studied to death. Uh, and so what often happens in, in, in the work I'm actually going to be doing for the sport on the Indigenous data sovereignty, as I'm talking to community members, they're saying, and not that I didn't know this already, but they're saying to me, make sure that the research comes back. So what often happens is you helicopter in, you talk to the people with lived experience, you might get them to check on something and then you never give it back to them. You write your research papers, you write your reports, you hand it off to policymakers, but they never hear your end result. That's helicopter research. Why are we not helicoptering back into whoever it is you talked to at the beginning? Why aren't you doing a community engagement session where you're telling them what you found? Just open it up online. How hard is that to do? Apparently it's very hard because people don't do it. Um, <laughs> so that was what I was talking about with helicopter research. And I think that there's, uh, that also gets to the other comment about, you know, this uh, inequity between doctors, healthcare professionals and, and people with lived experience, right? So if, if you don't set up in the beginning that, and we do this in indigenous circles, when I do any indigenous research, everybody in the circle is equal. We sit in a circle rather than sitting in rows or in hierarchies, everybody is to be seen. So we 
never look at the backs of everybody's heads like you do when you're sitting in a, a classroom or an auditorium. We can see each other. We can see when you smile. We can see when you're when you roll your eyes. We can see when you have your little nap. Um, yes, this does happen in things. I'm sure most of you have seen all of these things. Uh, but the problem that uh, we hear most or I hear most often with Indigenous people is you need to spend time in advance of even going for that grant. Um, I don't care what CIHR, SHRC, and CERC have to say or what the universities say. We have to have a research, like a research relationship, but the relationship, at least in Indigenous communities, is often beyond research. And that has to be in reciprocity. And when I say that, this is what I teach. Um, so I go in and I say, Carolyn, great, you have this experience. I want you to be part of the team. We're going to learn from you. So I ask you a whole bunch of questions. I ask people you know a whole bunch of questions. I take it. I analyze it. I've never asked you for your opinion, even though you're the person with lived experience. And I made a judgment on what you and other people with lived experience have said. And then I keep the data and I say it's my intellectual property. In fact, it is not. Every paper, report, presentation, grant you go for helps you as a researcher. So what is it doing for the people that you just asked to help you? Zero. So what are you giving back? There has to be a reciprocity piece. And when I say that, some of you are going, I don't understand. Uh, so when I work with Indigenous communities, that means I have to, on my own time, without a grant, go back and help. That might be I'm going to deliver groceries to the elders. It might be that I'm going to do an event for them. I might write a grant for them. That's reciprocity. When we don't do that, then we're saying we're better than the people who helped you to get where you are with that nice big title, whatever your title is. We have to stop that. And then make sure the data goes back to the community. I don't care if we're talking about patients with heart failure or patients with cancer. Why is it sitting at a university? Why don't they have copies of it? Why can't they have input on your analysis? You think they don't know how to read things? I mean, yeah, if it's statistics, okay, you do the first read and then ask them their opinion. That doesn't always happen. That's what I was getting at. So the helicoptering is you went in, you grabbed your research, made assumptions about the community, and then you go tell the world, but you've never asked them if you even got it right. We can't do that because that's how we're also keeping colonialism and the structural racism, ableism, genderism happening. It's through our words as researchers, what we're saying. So I hope that's kind of helps out there. That is amazing. Thank you so much, Angela. That is so important. Communication, right? <laughs> like, and also the engagement. I Yeah, when we talk about engagement, it has to be at every phase and stage of the research process from the priority setting, and it has to be a benefit to the community and to people with lived experience, and it has to come back. Um, that is such an important part of the relationship process. And even the idea of attending and supporting community events and doing things outside of the typical research, right? It's building those relationships and having food with people and having conversation and helping people out. Why, writing a letter of reference for someone who might be looking for a job and just wants some, what's a nice letter of reference, like all of those all of those aspects that we don't necessarily think about is showing people appreciation and showing people how they're valued and their engagement is so important. That was such a great point. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. Well, I'm sure everyone agrees. This has just been an incredible, incredible session. And Carolyn, thank you so, so much for sharing all of your knowledge and wisdom with us here today. We really appreciate it. This has been fantastic. And to see such great engagement in such a large setting, I think it shows that you have been able to create a safe space for all of us here or a brave space or accountable space or whatever you want to call it. But people felt good to, to share. <laughs> And we really appreciate that. So huge, huge thank you. Um, and I know there's even more stuff in the chat. And Carolyn, there's questions for you in the chat. 
you know, it'd be great if you can answer it. And if not, we'll send them to you after the meeting today. And it would be lovely if you could reach out to folks and answer because everyone just really loves your expertise and we all want to learn from you. So, and also there were suggestions that we want you to come back. So just as an FYI. <laughs> <laughs> thank, well, yeah. Thank you so much for, for everyone, for their participation and also for the amazing insight and knowledge that so many people brought uh, today as well to this conversation. I, I really, I really appreciate it. It's lovely. No, thank you so much.